Hello fellow adventurers and welcome back to our three-part series on the history and development of the alphabet. Uh, I'm here with my colleague Dr. Jackson Crawford. Many of you are familiar with his YouTube channel. Uh, the first part of this uh, particular series is posted on his channel uh, and following this video the third part will also be posted on his channel so be sure to go over there to check out parts one and three of this series. Um, now to briefly recap what we talked about in the first part of this series we traced uh, the development of writing from the pre-alphabetic days um, through the period of hieroglyphics in Egypt and cuneiform in Mesopotamia and then examined how that system uh, developed in, in a certain way into a, what we would, uh, kind of call a proto-alphabetic system uh, in, in the second millennium BC in the uh, part of the world that we would today call the Middle East um, and countries that we would today call Lebanon, Syria, Israel, and also Egypt um, because there was a lot of important things uh, going on there as well. Um, so we, uh, we got to the point in the story when the alphabet had developed into what we uh, call the Phoenician alphabet. Now, properly speaking, some of you probably know this, and if I don't say this, I'm sure somebody will comment on it. Uh, properly speaking, these uh, early systems were not officially what we would call alphabets. Um, they were a system that we would call abjads, and I don't know if we need to necessarily go into this too much. Um, the biggest difference between a proper alphabet and an abjad is that these, these uh, early systems only were able to write consonants. They didn't write vowels at all. Uh, and if you want to uh, see why that was not a problem for them, go back and watch part one because we talked about that. Um, so the Phoenician alphabet, um, which was mo one of many local varieties in that part of the world at that time period, uh, only wrote consonants. It had 22 consonant uh, graphemes or symbols, and that was all it needed. It didn't have vowels at all. Now, obviously, when they were speaking the language, they had vowels just like any language, um, but the writing system was uh, purely consonantal. Now, the Phoenicians were very important in the uh, subsequent development of writing systems around the world. Uh, they didn't probably know this at the time, that they were going to be such crucial players. Um, and that's certainly not what they were doing, what they were doing. But what they were doing was uh, becoming great merchants and uh, sailors. Uh, they were uh, located on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. That is Phoenicia. Um, and they sailed all across the Eastern Mediterranean, Central Mediterranean, even into the Western Mediterranean, and, and later further on. Um, the reason they did this was most, mostly uh, for uh, commercial ventures and trading and profit with different uh, groups of people who were living all over the Mediterranean. Now, when they did this, sort of as a matter of course, um, they were bringing ideas with them because that's what happens when you have trading partners and you talk to them. Um, you're not just going to sell them stuff, but you're going to tell them stuff as well. Um, and uh, so one of the main places that the Phoenicians uh, came to was, was Greece, uh, which is not that far, of course, from the eastern uh, part of the, I mean, it is in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, not too far from the far eastern shores of the Mediterranean. Um, and the Greeks had had a writing system uh, hundreds of years before uh, that belonged to this older layer of writing systems that we are talking about in part one that was not alphabetic uh, and it didn't really suit Greek, uh, the Greek language very well at all. Um, it, it's called, we today call it linear B. Uh, it's kind of a technical name, and that's not what the writing system would have been called to them. But those cultures all collapsed, and uh, and we don't actually really know what they would have called it. Um, either way, it was never a very widespread writing system. It was mainly utilized by bureaucrats living in palaces to keep tax records. Uh, so it really was not very exciting. Um, and as soon as that civilization collapsed and those bureaucrats got killed or whatever happened to them, um, the writing system basically died with them. So for about 400 years, uh, Greece did not have a writing system uh, as the Greek language was nonetheless there and developing. Uh, this all changed when the Phoenicians showed up and started trading with the Greeks um, sometime uh, around 800 BC, we think. Um, the earliest evidence for this is, is shortly thereafter. So what happened is the, uh, the Phoenicians brought this writing system, which as mentioned was fully continental and that's all it was, uh, but it was, it was uh, basically alphabetic. It was not a complicated system. Uh, it was recognizably similar to our modern system today. Um, one feature of the Phoenician alphabet 
that would have been common to all of the alphabets at that time period was that each letter had a specific name. Um, it wasn't just A, B, C. Uh, the, the, each letter had a name that was actually a word, a real word, in those Semitic languages uh, of that time and place. Um, so uh, the first letter in the Phoenician alphabet was Aleph. And Aleph was actually, again, not just a random series of sounds that didn't mean anything. Um, it, was a, it was a word that meant ox head. And, uh, and uh, correspondingly, the, the, the grapheme or the letter that would draw that sound looked kind of like maybe a, an ox head or a stylized ox head. Uh, the second letter in the Phoenician alphabet was, uh, was bet, and that was a, that's the word in Semitic languages for a house. Um, and it looked like a square or something with maybe like two rooms, like a very basic floor plan of a house, or maybe if you're looking at it from the front, like a two-story house, perhaps. Um, so the 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 uh, Phoenician alphabet, like any of these early Semitic alphabets, uh, consisted of pictures of things in real life, and then each each of those letters had a name that corresponded to what those things really were in real life. So most people don't know that, that, that anything, any writing system that descends from that particular writing system carries that, those ideas along with it. Why does the letter A look like the letter A, for instance? Um, if you look at it, you can kind of actually see that it looks like an ox skull or something like that, especially a capital A that's like this. That is not an accident. Those used to be horns in the middle. Um, and, and that used to be an ox skull. And in the uh, Phoenician alphabet, it was called ox skull, basically, because that is what it looked like. A little question. Yeah. That sequence of letters, Yes. right? Yes. Your Aleph, Beth, Gimel, mm -hmm. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, mm -hmm. ABC. Does that go back to something in particular or is it fundamentally arbitrary? Is there a reason for it? it it's, it, as far as we can tell, it's pretty arbitrary. Um, there doesn't seem to be a really good uh, uh, cultural reason for that particular order that we know of, although a lot of this is shrouded in mystery, so maybe there's something that we don't know about. Um, phonetically, the Aleph in the, uh, in the Phoenician and early Semitic alphabet was a glottal stop. It's the sound you make uh, between uh and o when you say uh-o in your throat. That was actually a consonant. That was a, that was a phoneme uh, in, in ancient Semitic languages in a way that it's not in English today. Um, so English speakers make this sound, but you would, we don't have a letter to write it. They had a letter to write it. It was the dead ox looking thing, basically, Aleph. Uh, that's what it was. By the way, that's a pretty good indication of uh, a reminder of how you can have sounds in your language you don't need to write. We have glottal stop. I, I say plenty of glottal stops in a day, right? Yep. Because between a word that ends in a vowel and a word that starts in a vowel, I'm going to say a glottal stop, right? Sure, sure. Um, but we don't consider that worth writing and because it gives you no information about the meaning of the words in English. It's a Sunday phenomenon. And in a sense, you could kind of look at the way that these early Semitic languages don't write vowels the same way. The right. Sound is there. Right. There's lots of sounds, as you, as you just very aptly pointed out, that we don't write because we don't feel the need to write them because they're not necessarily uh, necessary <laughs> to, to getting your point across. Yeah, it just occurred to me that there's a parallel there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as far as the order, uh, to go back to that question, no, there, there doesn't seem to be any really good reason for that order, um, even if there was originally. Now, the interesting thing is that there, there, there seem to have been two orders in archaic uh, times. One of them uh, started with H and then got weirder from there. Um, and that order seems to have been uh, confined to the very southern areas of Semitic language speaking. So uh, southern Arabia, the area of now Yemen uh, or Oman, um, used that order. Uh, in the ancient South Arabian script. However, everybody else used the uh, the alpha, beta, gamma. In other words, A, B, G, D, E mm. were the first five letters. And if you're wondering, wait, A, B, G, D, E, does this guy know his alphabet? We're going to get there. We're going to get there, I promise. Um, that was the archaic order, was A, B, G, D, E. Um, and that order proved remarkably stable throughout all of these transitions that we're talking about. Um, it, it probably goes back to the second millennium BC um, that, that, that you started with Aleph, you started with the Oxhead, then you went to the house, which was bait, going on the acrophonic principle that we talked about in the first video. Um, and then you went, on, you went on from there, essentially. Yeah, and the biggest break in that tradition is runes. Runes of a completely different order. Which we'll better. get to next video. Well, it's, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll touch on it here. Touch on it at least, yeah, yeah. that transition, yeah. 
Um, but before we get there, we have to do we have to talk about this very important transition, um, which uh, which is the transition from the Phoenician alphabet to the Greek alphabet. So the Greeks got the idea of this writing system straight from the Phoenicians, and uh, they didn't even try to hide it because they kept the order of the letters the same. And they kept the names of the letters very similar. So they heard the Phoenicians saying Aleph, and there would have actually been a glottal stop, like Aleph, which is hard to hear in English, uh, or maybe ever, but there was a glottal stop there at the beginning of Aleph in in, in that uh, Semitic word. Um, The Greeks uh, garbled it a little bit to Alpha, but it's still recognizably the same word. The difference is that in Greek, Alpha doesn't mean anything, Mm -hmm. right? Alpha is not a word in Greek. It was never a word in Greek. Um, They just took this word that meant something, a real word in Phoenician, uh, and they garbled it a little bit and said that's just the name of the first letter of this writing system. They did the same thing with bait, the house. They said beta. Beta is what this is, uh, and so and, and, and so on from there. Um, and yes, uh, in case you haven't uh, noticed this by now, this is where we get the word alphabet from. It's the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's where it comes from. Um, so the Greeks again, totally got the alphabet from the Phoenicians. There, there, there's, there's no controversy there whatsoever. Um, however, they couldn't just take it over without any change. Now, there, they had, the Greeks had two problems, which ended up being complementary problems. Um, one of the problems they had in this 22-character writing system that the Phoenician alphabet uh, consisted of was that in Phoenician, just like other Semitic languages, there were some sounds that the Greeks just didn't have in as part of their native phonetic inventory. So, for instance, these Semitic languages had a lot of guttural sounds in the back of your, of your throat, like k and k, not k, but k. It's, it's, it's further back. Um, they also had a wealth of what we call sibilant sounds, sounds that are S kind of sounds. Um, so the, the Semitic languages had S, SH, TS, SH, at least those four and maybe more. Um, so the Phoenician alphabet that the Greeks uh, used as the model for their adaptation had a lot of sounds or letters that, that they didn't need. Um, they just didn't need all those S's because in Greek, there was one S and it was S. They didn't even have SH. They just had S. Um, so they didn't need all these different S sounds or, or, or le- rather letters that could represent S sounds they didn't have because they only had one. They didn't need K because Greek didn't have K. It had K like a K. It didn't have K though. Uh, it didn't need H because Greek didn't have H. It didn't need the glottal stop because even if the Greeks said glottal stop sometimes in their language, just like in English, it was not something that was important to them. So out of those 22 letters that the Phoenician alphabet had, probably a good almost third of them were kind of superfluous uh, for the Greeks. On the other hand, and this is the other problem they had that was complementary to the first problem as it turned out, the the Greeks uh, and the Greek language in general w- was not really well suited to a writing system that didn't write vowels. Uh, unlike the Phoenicians who could get away with writing vowels no problem and still have a, have a very usable writing system, um, the, the Greeks would have had trouble without writing vowels because they had a lot of vowels and vowel distinctions that were very important in their language. It's an Indo-European language. Uh, And this is basically how all these ancient Indo-European languages are. Vowels are really important. Um, And they have words that start with vowels, unlike the Phoenicians. And so they they needed vowels. So what they did is they said, well, we have too many characters and we don't know what to do with all these characters, like Aleph, for instance. But then we need vowel characters. So what they did is they they changed some of these characters they didn't need into vowels. And Aleph is a great example of that. Um, They said, we don't need a letter for glottal stop. But we do need a letter for the vowel ah. What are we going to do? We're just going to take that same dead ox skull thing that the Phoenicians are giving us, still called alpha, but it's not going to be a glottal stop anymore. It's going to be the vowel ah. Um, They did this with the other vowels as well. So uh, the the E vowel, epsilon, in Greek, which would have originally just been E, not epsilon. The epsilon got added a little later. Um, E came from the, uh, the Phoenician H. Um, And because, uh, as I mentioned, Phoenician had basically two H's, a regular H and a guttural H. What the Greeks did is they took the regular H and turned it into E, and they took the guttural H and turned it into regular H. Uh, That's essentially how how they did that. Um, The O vowel, I'm skipping I for a reason, the O vowel actually came from a really guttural sound called I-N that the the Phoenicians used that was, um, as, as our 
linguistics uh, teacher and mentor, Dr. Jared Klein, once uh, famously said, and by famously, I mean, I just remember it many years later, um, the ayin is a sound that a person makes uh, half a second before choking to death. Um, uh, Dr. Klein is, 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 a, is very well acquainted with Hebrew, the Hebrew language, which, which uh, still has an ayin character, even if they don't pronounce it anymore. Um, so the, the Phoenicians had ayin, however that was pronounced. Uh, the Greeks said, we're not, we're not going to hurt our throats trying to make that sound. That's not a sound in our language, but we can use it for O. So they just used it for the O vowel, essentially, um, and kept it same place in the alphabet and actually just called it O. They didn't actually adapt that name. Um, they just called it O. Um, the I and the U, uh, they took sounds in the Phoenician alphabet that were what we call semi-vowels or glides. And, uh, and they used it to basically take these uh, Y and W consonant characters and transition them into vowels. Uh, as it turned out, Greek did not have a Y sound in their language. And so they just took the Y consonant from Phoenician, which was called Yod, and made it into Yoda. And they kept that name. Yoda is just Yod, but it's an I instead of a Y, essentially. Um, now, they had a different problem with the U or the W. Um, the uh, the Semitic speakers had a wa consonant that was called wow, uh, which didn't mean wow like in English today, but it sounds like it. Um, but the Greeks at this early date still had a consonant W, but they needed a vowel U, so they actually took that letter and split it into two letters, um, and they both looked kind of Y-ish in some ways because the original uh, the original Semitic forebear of that letter kind of had that look. Looks like a slingshot. Yeah, it really does. Um, so uh, so they split it into what would have originally been called wow, but they forgot this letter name pretty quickly. Um, and later on, it comes to be called digamma and falls out of the normal Greek alphabet entirely. But then the vowel version of it, um, they, they kept it looking very Y-ish, but they put it at the end of the alphabet. Uh, and they called it upsilon or u originally. Uh, and that's where that's actually the ancestor of our modern vowel u. And why? And Y ultimately, but NV, that's NV yeah, and W. UV, W, Y actually all come from this, um, and and uh, F also comes from this via via sort of an interesting uh, evolutionary path. So so yeah, the Greeks were able to sort of uh, solve these two problems at once by taking some of these letters and and converting them into vowel letters is essentially what they did. Um, okay, uh, they also had, they still had some letters left over. They still had too many S's that they didn't know what to do with. Um, and so w even though the Greek alphabet was adapted from Phoenician, there, there, were, there were still some things up in the air when it, when it kind of got out there into the Greek ecosystem. Uh, it was probably adapted, honestly, by one person at one place, and we're not sure who or where. Um, but once it got out there, there started to be a lot of variety in the early Greek alphabet. Um, and that variety had some important uh, uh, implications, ultimately. Um, there, there developed two main kinds of Greek alphabets, the Western and the Eastern Greek alphabet. Um, and that's referring to just Greece, like Western Greece versus Eastern Greece, including the islands of the Aegean Sea, which were mostly using the Eastern version of the Greek alphabet. Um, there were some differences in which Semitic S letter, S letter they used for their, uh, for their S. Um, and the sigma come, was an eastern thing, and uh, and the uh, son was a western thing, but but uh, the son kind of ultimately died out because you've probably never heard of son unless you really know a lot about this stuff. But you probably heard of sigma because sigma is the one that survived. The reason is that the eastern Greek alphabet would ultimately go on to be the one that we would consider to be the the standard Greek alphabet. Uh, if you if you've ever been in a fraternity or something. They're, they're using the Eastern Greek alphabet, not the Western Greek alphabet. Uh, and, and there's a whole lot of history behind this. So we probably don't need to go into all the details as to how the Eastern Greek alphabet ultimately won out. But as you can imagine, politics and other things, militaries are involved. Um, but, but the Eastern Greek alphabet was ultimately the one that won out. One notable difference. In a, in a sense, because it's the Western Greek alphabet that lives on the Roman alphabet, yes. which is the true. Which one really alphabet. won out? Yeah. Which one really won out? In Greece, the Eastern Greek alphabet won out. Um, one notable difference between the Western and the Eastern Greek alphabet that's not just getting into the weeds that we don't really need to talk about, but is actually important, is what this this letter was. This thing that I'm doing with my fingers here that looks like an X and actually 
is an X. Um, now, if you know any Greek, the letter that looks like an X in Greek today in our Greek alphabet is called a chi, um, and it is not pronounced X. It was originally a K sound. It was like a K with a puff of air. It's often trans times transliterated KH or CH, um, and, and, and that's what the chi was. That was the in the Eastern Greek alphabet. That thing that looked like an X was pronounced K, and that's what that letter was used for. Uh, used for, and that's why the modern Greek alphabet uses chi as a K thing. However, in the Western Greek alphabet, that letter, that same letter that looks like an X, was used as K. You could transliter transliterate it K S if you wanted. Now. That's, of course, what we use in our native uh, English alphabet that is, uh, that is much older than the English language, and we're going to talk about uh, where that ultimately comes from as well. That's because the, the ancestor of the English alphabet is actually the Western Greek alphabet, not the Eastern Greek alphabet. How did this happen? Well, during this particular time period when there was all this diversity in the different kinds of Greek alphabets after it had been adapted from Phoenician, um, some of the the speakers of Greek who used the Western Greek alphabet uh, sailed over to Italy, to the Italian peninsula, and uh, started founding some colonies. Uh, and just like the Phoenicians sailed to Greece and brought their alphabet, the Greeks sailed to Italy and, and brought their alphabet, and the same thing happened. People who were native to Italy, or living in Italy at the time in any case, um, said, hey, this is a great idea. And they actually took the Western Greek alphabet, not the Eastern Greek alphabet, and adapted it to their native needs. Uh, do you want to say anything here, or should I keep going on? Well, let's stipulate those native Italian peoples are the Etruscans first, Absolutely. before the Romans. Yes. And what's strange is that the, we know so little about the Etruscans and their language. Uh, in fact, exactly how to classify Etruscan is a huge issue. It's certainly not Italic. Um, whether it's Indo-European or not is something that you have to get in, deep in the weeds mm -hmm. about. Most mm -hmm. people think it isn't. But it had an incredible, indelible influence on how every single language in Western Europe would be written because of just weird aspects of Etruscan. Yeah, so the, uh, the Etruscans were the first group living in Italy to get hold of this uh, Western Greek alphabet. Um, and, and one weird thing about Etruscan phonology, in other words, their sound system, the sounds that they had in their language, was that they did not have voiced stops. They did not have the sounds b, d, g in native Etruscan. So uh, when the Etruscans got the Greek alphabet, they had a kind of similar problem to what the Greeks had had maybe 100 years before when they got the Phoenician alphabet. They said, well, we don't need all these letters. Um, we don't need P and B. We don't need T and D. We don't need K and G um, because we don't have the sounds budaga. Now, kind of like with the Greek alphabet, the Etruscan alphabet went through a period of a couple hundred years where it was, a little, it was in flux and they were trying to figure out what to do with these extra letters. And so they just kept them and used them sometimes. Um, but they would, they, it seems like what they would do is they would write P or B and either way you knew it meant P. Uh, they would write T or D and either way you knew it meant T. And they would write K or G, and either way, you knew it meant K, because they just didn't have those the three of those six sounds. So you knew which one it was. Um, another another complication they had is that the the Western Greek alphabet in particular uh, still had a letter uh, that was the ancestor of Q. Now uh, this we need to reach all the way back to Phoenician to explain this one. Uh, again, in Phoenician they had a K sound like a regular K and a K sound which was kind of like a K but further back in your throat. Um, and the Greeks didn't need this distinction at all, so this distinction quickly dropped out of the Greek alphabet. They really had no use for the Q thing in the Greek alphabet at all, and so they just kept the K, which of course is Kappa today. Uh, however, the, the version, it's clear that the version of the Western Greek alphabet that was exported to the Itali Italian peninsula had Q in it still. Uh, even though the Greeks didn't need it, the Etruscans didn't need it, nobody needed it. Um, but that letter was still there because when the alphabet made it to Italy, or modern day Italy, it still had K and Q. And uh, you probably know why, because you know what K and Q are. Those, the, the, that distinction has not disappeared. Uh, however, the Etruscans now had three letters for sounds that were kind of K. They had K, they had G, and they had Q. So for the Etruscans, 
the the way that they tried to handle this uh, embarrassment of riches when it came to letters for a cuh sound was uh, was they said we're going to use the, these letters in different contexts depending on the following vowel. Um, so we're going to use K if the next letter is a. Uh, we're going to use uh, G, uh, which they wrote like this, by the way, that looks a lot like our modern C. Um, we're going we're gonna to use that sound that was originally G, but in the C place in the alphabet, remember the original order was A, B, G, D, E. Um, so this is, this is what we would call C today, but it was, it was still a G, basically. Um, we're going to use this G letter for uh for anything that's before a front vowel so like e or i and then we're going to use that q letter for anything that's before a back vowel like o or u and that's how the etruscans managed to keep all three of these letters alive in their language for a while even though they really only need one of the three to write their particular language and this is the version of the alphabet that the Romans got a hold of. Um, the Romans were a were within the cultural orbit of the Etruscans. Um, this is way before the Romans were powerful uh, or important, really. Um, they were a very small tribe living in central Italy, in, uh, in you know under the political sway and influence of the Etruscans. So what happened is the alphabet went from the Greeks, uh, from the Western Greeks, the Etruscans. Uh, uh, took took it over and adapted it some for their needs, and then the Romans got that adapted version of the Etruscan alphabet. So there's actually multiple stops along this journey between uh, the Phoenicians ultimately and the Romans, and along each of those stops, there were some mutations uh, to the alphabet that have sort of left their uh, their uh, footprints, if you will. There, and and that's actually a good word because the word vestigial comes from the Latin word for footprint. And so they left some vestigial detritus in the Roman alphabet. Uh, if you've ever wondered what, what's going on with the letter Q, th this is the reason. It's basically a vestigial letter. It's the appendix of the alphabet. So the Romans get the alphabet, but it's already a heavily worked over alphabet, basically. Um, and they have an issue because the Etruscans have been using... Uh, they again the Etruscans didn't need voiced stops. They didn't need B D G and and fortunately they had they had kept these letters but but uh, and, and for 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 D um and for B the Romans actually just reverted to using them in their original uh their original intended meanings. In other words, the Romans did have voiced stops. In other words, B D B D G um, and for B and for D, they were like, okay, uh, the Etruscans are giving us P and B. We're going to go back to saying P is P and B is B, T and D. We're going to go back to saying T is T uh, and D is D. But something something weird happened along the way well, with K and K and G. Consider an interesting fact there. That means that even though they're enough under Etruscan sway, they're using the Etruscans version of the alphabet, mm -hmm. they do have contact with someone else who's using them. A more original system, right? Clearly, because they're able to remember. Yeah, it's yeah, Greeks. Yeah. They clearly know some but, Greeks as well. Yeah. So, but it's interesting still that they're not adopting just adopting the Greek system, which would no. have been fine for Latin. Would have been fine. Would have been better than the Etruscan system, actually. Yeah. There's yeah. something. There's some interesting sociocultural thing, you know, in the early first millennium BC yeah. that's making them go with the system that's actually not as well fitted as it could have been. Right. Right. So it probably says something about the. Etruscan political cultural hegemony of that time period that they they thought the Etruscans were a better group to get the alphabet from than the Greeks who actually you know, the, the Etruscans got it from the Greeks originally. Um, so you have a weird situation where the Romans get this alphabet and they manage to fix some of the things that the Etruscans had done to it, but for some reason and I don't I'm really not sure why they don't fix one glaring problem and that is that the Etruscans now have two K letters actually three K letters if you count Q, and no G letters. So the Romans don't fix the gamma or the third letter of the alphabet between B and D. They don't fix that back to G. Um, they say this is another K letter. So they have what we would call C, was always K, it's pronounced K in Latin. Uh, and then you have what we would call K is always pronounced K in Latin. And then you have what we would call Q, which is always pronounced K in Latin. The Romans lived under this uh, sort of self-imposed tyranny of no genus for a couple hundred years. Um, they, 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 they could have easily just fixed the C back to a G like it originally was, but they never did. Um, they actually did something else to fix their alphabet, but it took them, it, it took them hundreds of years to do this. Um, what they did is they said, well, we need a guh, we need a G letter for our, our, our uh, phonology because we totally have a guh 
Um, how do we do this? How do we do this? Um, what they did is they took a C and they put a little hook on it. I'm doing it so you can see it. They took a C and they put a little hook on it and they said, this is like a modified K, but it's a voiced K, so it's a G. They're very similar sounds. Uh, and then they said, we have a new letter. Look, we invented a new letter off of the C. It's called a G or a G. And then they needed to put it somewhere in the alphabet. And they said, where can we put it in the alphabet? Now, they could have put it at the end. The Greeks had already invented some letters and put them at the end of their alphabet. Um, but what they did instead is they took the old Z and they didn't really need it in the, in the spoken Latin of that time period. They, they, they said it's dropping out. Um, what, and so they just said, we're going to take the Z out and put this new G letter in uh, what, what is the seventh position of the alphabet. So it's between F and H, which is where Z used to be if you go back to the older Phoenician and Greek alphabets. But in the Roman alphabet, uh, that is where G is, and Z totally fell out for a little while. Uh, what should we talk about next? Should we talk about the, the added letters at the end? Yeah, probably YZ. And, and clarify, too, the... Uh... In the in the different worlds of East versus West, you have a lot of the same character s symbols mm -hmm. that sometimes are just used in different ways. Yes, uh, and then you have some symbols that just have a modified look. Probably the most important that's modified in a lot of the Western Greek alphabets is rho, where you get an extra letter, a little extra line on that letter. Hence, our English R, and then the uh, the pi which doesn't have a completing loop some some places in the west it's just kind of a gallows right and, uh, right anyway that loop is completed to make our p which looks like the eastern greek row that's why you get that weird pr confusion right so that's a good point that that's ac those are actually the same letters in the same positions in the alphabet they just look a little bit different uh, and they tend to throw people off but once you once you see it the way jackson explained it it's pretty pretty easy to see that uh the, the connection between pi and p is just an extra line uh, or the connection between uh row and r is just an extra line yeah. so it's, it's 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 really not but not too different but that distinction precedes the roman alphabet that oh, yeah. distinction is there it's a western versus eastern greek alphabet problem right and right. one of my big hobby horses is pointing out that people who say that the runes must come from the Roman alphabet often aren't aware there's varieties of the Greek alphabet where that's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, but those R's already look like our R's. Yeah, yeah. So in the Roman Republican period, uh, say second century BC, uh, the Roman alphabet, let me, let me count this in my head, I think this is the right number, consisted of 21 letters. Um, they had dropped out Z and replaced it with G, so they didn't. that did not actually impact the number of letters. The J did not exist yet. We'll get to that in the third video. Um, and they had a letter that looked like this, uh, that we would call V, but they used it for U and V, so that was just one letter. Uh, w did not yet exist, and Y and Z did not yet exist. So X was the last letter of this, uh, this classical Roman alphabet. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about how J and then uh, V and W, you know, come in later. But we will, uh, I think, round out this video by talking about where Y and Z come from, because they got added uh, right around the end of the Republican period into the classical Roman period to increase the number of letters from 21 to 23. Um, basically, what happened is during this time period, the Romans uh, came into contact once again uh, with the Greeks. And the reason is that the Roman Empire or Republic at this point was growing very quickly. And it took over the entire Eastern Mediterranean, which was heavily Greek speaking, very infused with Greek culture. Um, and the Romans uh, started borrowing all these Greek words into Latin, uh, cultural words and things like that, um, because the Greeks had this great history of culture and learning, and the Romans really respected that. Um, however, there were two sounds in the spoken Greek of that time period that did not exist in Latin. Uh, one of them was a uh, fronted, uh, a high front vowel with rounded lips, e. The Greeks had that, the Romans did not have e. Um, the other sound was a composite like sound that we would probably transliterate something like dz or maybe z d z, z, d that kind of sound um the romans didn't have that remember they had dropped out their z a couple hundred years earlier so they didn't even have a z uh in their alphabet at all but now they were getting these greek loan words from from the eastern mediterranean with these two sounds what we would call y and z um and so they said well we we need these we need two new letters in the roman alphabet uh and they just borrowed the greek upsilon 
which looks like a Y, and the Greek Zeta, I guess that way for you, which looks like a Z. Um, and so as not to mess with the order of the alphabet, they just they just crammed both of them at the end of the alphabet. And so uh, by the classical Roman period, you get the familiar end of the alphabet X, Y, Z, even though X used to be the last letter of the Roman alphabet before that particular adaptation happened. Uh, so that brings us up to uh, to a, a more mature looking uh, Roman alphabet. Again, we are still missing uh, three letters. We're only at 23 right now. Yes, but we're almost familiar. Yeah. And, and certainly the letter shapes are familiar. Absolutely. And notice that this also means that Y and U are in origin the same letter, mm-hmm. the WA, mm-hmm. and so is F. Right. Yeah. And okay. we didn't actually talk about F at all. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. You want to talk about F a minute? Yeah, let's briefly talk about F. Um, so F is in the position in the alphabet that the Greek digamma was in which was the W sound, and that in turn comes from the Phoenician wow, which is just the W sound. So that used to be the W position in the alphabet. Now, the Greeks, uh, most Greek dialects lost W, and so that letter ultimately fell out, but it was clearly part of the Western Greek alphabet that was transmitted to Italy. So, uh, so again, this is another case where Greek lost a letter, but not before they transmitted that letter to Italic cultures. Um, now, the digamma looked like an F. I mean, it really just looks like an F. Um, but the Romans uh, were using the upsilon looking thing uh, for an F, which looks like the V. If you know Latin and you've ever learned any Latin, the, the thing that looks like a V is pronounced W. I remember when I took Latin in middle and high school, that was like the first thing they tell, told us was all the V's are W's, get used to it. Um, because that's, that, that, was, that's, that comes from the Greek uh, upsilon. But they had the digamma, the Greek digamma, that they didn't use this W. Instead, the Romans, and actually, there's there's a whole fraught history, and 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 there's some there there uh, we're actually not 100 percent sure uh, how this happened, when it happened. There are different theories you can go look up. Um, but the the W letter in the W place in the alphabet evolved into. F. And it looks exactly the same. They didn't change how it looked at all, but they changed how it sounded. Um, What happened is that the Romans, along with other Italic languages, had an F sound in their uh, their native Italic languages, like Latin. Greeks did not have an F sound at that point, uh, and Phoenicians did not have an F sound at that point. So F was not part of the alphabetic inheritance. Right, and phi didn't mean F. Yeah, phi did not yet mean F, and it would not for many hundreds of years. It was P not pho at that point in Greek. Um, so the, the Romans needed an F sound. They were not given an F letter. Um, and so it seems like what they did is they adapted the W letter because w and pho are both sounds you make with your lips. They're labial sounds. Um, and that, that seems to be the origin of F uh, as far as what we would you know, consider today in its place in the alphabet, sixth position, uh, and, its, and, and, and the, uh, you know, the sound that it has as an F and not a W like it used to. And look, a couple more things we didn't cover that, um, we, uh, that, that bear some mentioning. Yeah. One is that we've also gotten to a point where the direction of writing is stabilized. Yes, yes. So originally in the uh, early West Semitic alphabets, it's mostly right to left, although yes. we also see boustrophodon writing, which means you start writing from the right toward the left, you hit the left margin of whatever you're writing on, and you flip around and write left to right, and you snake across the page. Boustrophodon actually means is the ox plows. So it's like an ox plowing a field going right to left and right left to right. Uh, the reason this isn't stabilized is that, of course, these early alphabets or abjads are being adapted from Egyptian writing, which doesn't have a set direction of writing. Instead, you read the text in the direction that the human and animal faces are pointed. So it, it can be adapted to right, left, up, down, whatever. Um, and that that inconsistency and that preference for Bustrophodon writing shows up in early Greek. It shows up in Elder Futhark. Another reason to think the Futhark is, is somewhat older than its oldest inscriptions and, and derived from Greek or something something Greek adjacent. And it shows up in the earliest inscriptions in our Roman alphabet, right? So the Duenos inscription, the earliest confirmed Roman right. alphabet inscription uh, is right to left, right? Um, so is the Prinocene fibula if it's real. If it's real, which uh, we would love it to be, Yeah, but we don't know. And these are from uh, like 600, if 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 yep. the fable is real, but mm-hmm. the drawing mm-hmm. is from about 600 BC. Right, and we also see this this same uh, uh, hesitancy as to how to write, in other words, which direction to write in, in the earliest Greek inscriptions, which are often boustrophodon, 
Um, in uh, fact, Mr. Scup is, isn't Mr. Scup right to left? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you, you, it was in, in, in the early, you know, wild West period of the alphabet. This was not a fixed order. Um, again, it, like, like Jackson mentioned, it, it, it really wasn't fixed from the beginning. Uh, these Semitic languages ultimately fixed it right to left. Like you read, you know, most Semitic languages right to left. Right. Um, and then when the Semitic cultures like the Phoenicians gave it to the Greeks and ultimately to the Romans, it took it took a couple hundred years for it to fossilize as a left to right thing, um, which is sort of how we take European writing systems for granted today. But that's not necessarily how it was originally. If you go back and read some of those old inscriptions, you'd, you'd better be ready to zigzag. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it's, you know, the you can make practical arguments either way. I mean, left, right has a certain practical argument if you're writing with ink because mm-hmm. your hand isn't smudging it if you're right-handed. If you're right-handed, which most people were and are. But they're not writing with ink. No. Nope. Right? So there's nope. it, it, there's not exactly a clear practical argument for it one way or another. It's just right. custom. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So we've looked at our earliest Greek inscriptions a little bit, talked about early Roman inscriptions, how the Roman alphabet adapted Western Greek alphabet. Anything mm-hmm. else you think we have to do to tie this up? No, I think that's a good, good channel. Yeah, I, well, I think that's a great place to stop. Um, I think that's a great place to, to throw it back to your channel uh, for right. for part three, where uh, you are mostly. I'll still be here, but you are mostly going to uh, take this story even further into uh, you know past the past the Roman uh, chapter in this story. Talk a little bit about uh, runes and uh, what happened in the Middle Ages with these final three letters to get to our modern uh, twenty six letter alphabet. Uh, So we'll see you over there for part three. Uh, Talk to you then.